today I'm going to talk about what is step one. That's something that I really wish I would have known about early on in medical school. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, don't worry about it. Wait until your second year. But I feel like knowing about this earlier, the better starting to prepare um, in minute ways. And I'm going to talk about kind of ways that you can prepare further out from the exam, uh, which is pretty huge. Uh, so we will dive into that. But first, if you don't already follow me on Instagram, follow me at medical underscore mache. And I keep forgetting to put that here. So I'm going to do it now mental note. Follow me on Instagram, follow me there, as well as like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Leave a comment if you'd like. Let me know some options for recording things that you would like to hear, all of that. So yeah, let's get into it. Periodically, I'm going to look at my notes just to keep on track. So follow me. Okay, what is step one? Step one is a board exam for your medical licensure and to practice in the United States of America. So you will take step one um, if you plan on practicing in the United States, regardless of what medical school you go to or what kind. So that means even if you're at a DO, MD, Caribbean school, you're going to take step one if you plan on practicing in the United States. I can't emphasize that enough. So um, there's that. Basically, there's no getting away from it. <laughs> Sorry. With the formatting of step one, step one is seven blocks. Each block is an hour long with 40 questions. And this totals to 280 questions for my math whizzes. It is vignette kind of structure. So that means it's going to be organized as 37 year old insert gender here comes in with chief complaint. They're going to give you a couple sentences with details of the possible diagnosis or kind of leading you up to the symptoms. Um, maybe some past medical history that may be pertinent, family medical history that could be pertinent, even social history that could be pertinent. And then they might even include lab findings that could be pertinent to answering the question, or they could just be junk and everything's normal and it's irrelevant. And then finally, they'll have a question. And the question, sometimes it could be, you know, what is the diagnosis? But it could also be something super detailed, such as the biochem, the etiology, epidemiology about the diagnosis, um, other clinical presentations, um, risk factors or things that kind of put them at risk. So it really is just basically anything. This can be pretty overwhelming um, because it does kind of ask questions that are very, very detailed. And then the options, because it is multiple choice, can often be very similar to one another. So some part of the one part of getting to the right answer is knowing the other options well enough to rule them out. So it's equally knowing the right answer and knowing why the other answers are not correct. It's a doozy. So there's that. It is administered through NBME. This is the National Medical Education Board, I think. And <laughs> this is basically analogous to double AMC and how they administer the MCAT. So um, with step one timeline, uh, most people will take step one, the spring leading into their third year of medical school. Um, for most schools, it is required before starting clerkships. Caveat, there are many schools that now give step, have students take step one after their third year. This is after their first year of clerkships. So this could be pretty relieving. Um, they get basically that exposure to clinical medicine and they get the opportunity to work with patients and see the formatting. And then step one is a little more palpable because it is essentially that clinical exposure mixed with the details of pathology and diagnosis. So there's that. There are several subjects on um, step one. And the idea is that medical schools are teaching based through their curriculum these subjects. This can be done, you know, depending on how the curriculum is set up. Ours is system based. So the way our curriculum is at, at my school is we have eight week blocks of a specific system. So like cardio palm for eight weeks, GI renal for eight weeks. Um, musculoskeletal and so on and so forth. So this is a really helpful kind of format. And the reason that it would have helped me to kind of know about step one earlier is because as we learned about these systems, I kind of could have 
um, organize my studies in a way that still incorporated that practice and getting the structure of the exam down sooner. So that's a really deep detail that we'll just keep going with format. Anyway, so the following subjects are on step one, cardio or cardiology, respiratory, GI or gastrointestinal, urinary or renal, endocrinology, reproductive, biochem, pharmacology, epidemiology, musculoskeletal, anatomy, as well as physiology, hemonc, psych, and neuro. If I missed any, I'm super sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's all of them. I definitely use my resources to double check, but just in case. Those are the subjects that are covered on step one, and all of the subjects are kind of intermingled. So there is no organized structure based on when the subjects are presented to you throughout the test. At any time, you could be tested on any of these concepts, and often they overlap. So you could get a question that is classified as a cardiology question, but it mixes in some renal, or it mixes in endocrinology, it mixes in neuro. So that's what makes it kind of hard, is that all of these concepts can really kind of overlap in a way that, like, if you don't have it organized, it can really trip you up. So that's that. So moving to um, resources, often, um, people will use what's called UFAPS. Sorry for the train. So UFAPS stands for UWorld, First Aid, Anki, and Pathoma, and Sketchy. So there's that. Um, so if you don't use some of these resources or like certain ones, it's perfectly fine. These are just like the high yield resources that most students will use. I ended up using all of these. So some students will use all of them. Some of them will mix in other resources that we'll talk about because there are many other resources that people don't talk about. Um, and I will highlight some resources that, you know, I wish I would have known about earlier in medical school or in my studies to really kind of focus on that. So uh, I'm gonna run through some of the high yield resources just so that you get an idea of what they are. I feel like a lot of these were kind of thrown around while I was in medical school and nobody ever took the time to actually explain what it is. So UWorld is a question bank. They have anywhere between 3,000 and 3,500 questions. Uh, and I say anywhere between because I feel like they're always adding new questions. And I think at this point they're higher than what I started at, but I'm not really sure I took step one um, last year. So. I know they've been adding questions like crazy. So, um, UWorld Question Bank, uh, okay. UWorld Question Bank, uh, and they also include uh, two practice tests depending on what package you get, but two practice tests are also available on UWorld. Um, so UWorld is really great because not only do they have really solid questions that really test foundation of the concept, but they also have really great explanations, and I kind of mentioned UWorld on my MCAT video, but they have really great explanations, really awesome pictures. They even include uh, research references if you want to like deep dive into the question. I don't know who has that time, but um, it's just a really awesome like resource for testing your knowledge. You can also focus the questions based on concepts as well as subjects within a concept. So they get really detailed on being able to test your understanding. There's a feature for note taking as well as flashcard making. You cannot screenshot on this app um, or this website. Um, and there's also a phone version as well. You can do it either timed or tutor mode and you cannot make um, a block longer than 40 questions. And this is like basically replicating how a block would look for your actual step one. So it's really nice because you can basically do chunks. And if you wanted to do like a mock exam with seven blocks, you could do that as well. I don't think I mentioned that you get an hour's worth of break time in your uh, step one. So it totals to eight hours, but seven hours is actually doing concepts. And then you get an hour's worth of break, which you can kind of manipulate as you like. If you want to do five minutes in between or anything like that, then you can do that. It's kind of sticky if you run out of time um, before, you know, your last block or your last couple blocks, because at that point you don't have a choice and you have to keep going. So it's really important to kind of understand your pattern, your flow, um, and know the break time that you would need respectfully. So uh, moving on into our resources, first aid. First aid, actually I have my, whew, so I used a PDF of first aid. Um, I'm a digital kid, 
and I'm very much so a millennial, so I don't really use books. Um, but uh, I use a PDF copy of First Aid. If you do not have access to a PDF copy, the hard copy will work just fine. Um, and I use the PDF copy just because I am a control fine kind of person, um, as well as I like to highlight in different colors. And I just don't like the risk that you run when you could possibly get rained on. And yeah, that stresses me out if my book was damaged or anything like that. So I just don't do it. <gasps> if you are a hard copy person, First Aid is basically the step one Bible. Sorry, uh, I am a religious person and I don't mean to, you know, take away from the actual Bible. But for all intents and purposes, this is the step one Bible. It covers everything that's on step one as well as um, includes kind of just the high yield details. I will include a video on how to go through first aid. I feel like a lot of people try to read it, which is like insane. It's not like meant to be a lounging read through kind of book. Um, it is really like a study a portion and then apply it or refer to it if you missed a concept and you're not really understanding it. Um, but it's not necessarily like just read through the whole book in like several sittings. That's like crazy. And it's also like incredibly boring if you're just trying to read through it. So I mean, good luck to the people who actually did that at work, but it wasn't for me. Sorry, Anki. So uh, there's several pre-made decks for Anki, um, which is called, I know the biggest one being On King. Um, but I mean, there's so many pre-made decks. There's the Pepper deck, LOL, not a cop. I'm probably just saying a bunch of random gibberish that nobody understands, but Anki is a really awesome resource. I used it for my MCAT. Um, and I mean, it's a flashcard making uh, database essentially. It is free on your computer, um, and I'm pretty sure for Androids it's free. For iPhones, you have to pay a hefty sum. Well, it's like 25 bucks. Um, so hefty for me, maybe not for you. <laughs> um, 25 bucks for the app, uh, and essentially it is a flashcard app. What's so good about it is you can virtually make any kind of flashcard. There's really cool add-ons and things that you can do to kind of sculpt it for your learning purposes um and so i decked anki out just because i know anki i used it throughout medical school i used it for mcat and it's just a really great resource um it gets kind of exhausting because you're literally going through flashcards over and over and over but if you get the hang of it and you start early enough you won't be spending ridiculous amounts of time and i'll also talk about in a later episode how i used anki for my step one studies and once i really got the flow of using it when it started working for me um because for me pre-made decks just didn't really work for me i had to make my own cards and so i'll go over that with you all in another episode what is our next resource pathoma so pathoma is a really cool resource i used pathoma when i was studying for my curriculum exams um and pathoma is essentially a really smart doctor whose name I, escapes me, but he's a genius. And he also has like a book set that goes with his videos. He basically gives lectures, but the way he explains it is really like intuitive. He makes it really understandable, easy to like kind of walk through pathology. And that's what it stands for. It's like pathology, which, okay, call me crazy. I always thought that was just like slides and things like that. But really pathology is like disease diagnosis and like everything surrounding a disease. So he basically goes into detail for every subject, the pathology, um, epidemiology, clinical features, how it might be asked in a question. So really just convenient things. I would highly suggest organizing this early on in your studies so that you can get through all of the pathoma videos as well as um, actually applying them in your studies. And that can be really huge. I think where I messed up is I tried to watch all the Pathoma videos right away and then I didn't really understand how to apply it. So I would highly encourage you to kind of mix it in. Always do questions practicing what you're studying. I think the best way to really solidify things is the application. You have to practice the application. And then if, it, if you realize that, you know, the content just isn't there, then take time to work on that. But always practice application because that's going to tell you whether or not what you're doing is working. So then our final resource is Sketchy. Sketchy is my girl. So Sketchy is essentially a cartoon like website or whatever. And they 
work on using your memory. It's a huge memory tool. So what they'll do is associate different disease um, symptoms. They have pathology, so they have diseases, they have micro, they have um, farm, and I think now they have anatomy. They also have biochem. So they have pretty much everything for sketchy. So virtually what it is is a picture, and I would highly recommend using sketchy micro and farm. Sketchy micro, sketchy farm. These are like gold. And this is because those nitty gritty details that really don't have any association, you just have to like know it. They give you a picture and they associate each detail with a part of the picture. And this is really helpful because you may not remember that mucor rhizopus is, you know, treated with amphotericin. But you'll remember that there's a car that's shaped like a frog. I don't even, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And that is how you'll know that it's treated with amphotericin B. Stuff like that. So you might not remember that, you know, carbamazepines can be used to treat trigeminal neuralgia. But you might remember that there were three gems in the carbamazepine um, next to the diner. And that is actually what kind of makes that connection for you. And that's actually what makes the connection for me. So it's just stuff like that. It's, it's literally taking photographic memory and applying it to learning the concepts. It's completely random, but it works outstandingly well. I love sketchy. I've always loved sketchy. My favorite section is psych drugs. Literally, I could probably tell you anything about Parkinson's drugs. So they try to make it fun, um, but it's a really good way to kind of get those little details in that you otherwise might not have anything to associate with it. Um, other resources that I wish I'd known about uh, before my studies began, um, and some of the resources that I use uh, is called IOMB. It's Institution of Medical Board Exam. And it's basically uh, kind of like a post back program. Um, and it's based out of Kansas City, which is one of the reasons I knew about it. Um, but people from all over the country use this program. It's pretty pricey. It can be anywhere between $1,500, $2,500. But essentially, it is a program that really focuses on teaching you first aid. And they do a great job of giving, you know, details that might otherwise be missed. They have outstanding physicians that really take time to explain to students, um, this is what you need to know, as well as they practice the application with you. They have really great tips on how to get to the right answer and how to review your questions. And it's really, really, really helpful. I love this program so much. The people are so wholesome and and they really do care about the students who take their programs um, and it's a huge resource that I feel like more people should really take advantage of. If at all your school can offer you some type of scholarship or some type of funding I would highly recommend taking that program and I will include the link uh, in the description below as well so that you guys all have access to it. They have different um, time brackets and different course durations so like uh, basically you take a course and so it's going to be anywhere between four to six weeks. They have virtual options, in-person options, so you really do just have to kind of see what is available, but they really do take their students seriously and I love it. So, uh, IOMB is a huge resource. I-O-M-B. So another resource that I feel like was really helpful for me was Cram Fighter. So essentially they have um, every resource for step one and you put it in, you select what resources you're using and you pick what date you'd like to be completely done with studying that resource. You also include your exam date. So let's say you want to finish a resource far before your exam date, you can do that. You can also include like days that you need off, um, which days you like to take off throughout the week, and it gives you a study schedule. This is huge. It literally shapes out, this is the resource, this is how long you'd like to study, and this is how long you're gonna study for each day. And it has a timeline that basically plans you completely finishing that resource within that time. It's really important to actually do it, easier said than done, trust me. But Cram Fighter is a really great way to kind of knock that out and uh, really have a steady study plan. Um, and it takes like literally minutes to figure out like it's the easiest way to make a study plan and it's very, very helpful. So um, I will also include details for that below. Okay, so um, another resource that I feel like I 
should have been using honestly earlier in my medical school journey um just for my like uh subject exams as well but amboss amboss is a really great resource they're really detailed their questions are pretty challenging but they really do a great job of testing whether or not you know the information well enough to apply it and that's really huge uh, they also have a really cool feature that allows you to see the highlighted portion that you basically should have pick picked up on to make the diagnosis or answer the question or whatever have you. Um, but their questions are pretty challenging. It's a really awesome resource. Mind you, I'm not getting sponsored for any of this. And boss, if you'd like to sponsor me, I love you guys. I'm always going to be vouching for you. Always going to be pubbing you. Really would be nice if you could throw your girl a coin. But here we are doing it for free. So yeah, I think those are the major resources that I really appreciated using when I was studying for step one. And I know I threw a lot of resources at you guys, but really it's like um, you kind of use the ones that work for you. Another resource that I'd like to include is Boards and Beyond. Boards and Beyond is a really cool resource. And I actually did use this when I was studying for my exams in my uh, first and second year. Uh, Boards and Beyond is basically similar to Pathoma, but I feel like he goes into a little more detail. Shout out to Dr. Ryan. Um, and he really does a great job of making it all really intuitive. Um, and it's really hard to kind of get some of these concepts down. So just watching a few of those videos to really get a foundation can make the difference in you even learning things to a deeper extent and practicing that application effectively. So that's really big. Now that we've gone through the resources, I'd like to kind of talk about um, timeline and dedicated. So dedicated is the amount of time that's allotted for most medical students when they are studying for step one. This is a really critical time. Something that I definitely heard most of my classmates say was that they were gonna wait for dedicated to even worry about step one. And this is like terrible. I think this is a terrible idea. Mind you, I took step one when it was being scored. Um, it is now pass fail, which we will talk about um, later in the video. But I think even if it's pass fail, you can still fail this test and that is a real reality. Um, so I think it's very important that you start studying for this based on what kind of student you are, how your first and second year has gone. If you've experienced failings, tests and things like that, I would highly recommend getting a jump on this as early as possible. Um, and it's, it's hard to actually do that. It feels so overwhelming when you first look at these questions because it is a lot. But the earlier you get the hang of these questions, the better you'll be, trust me. Um, and so timeline, ideally people wanna get through their content um, studying, uh, if not before dedicated, definitely within the halfway mark of dedicated because you really do wanna use a lot of dedicated for application and going over questions. Um, and that can be very, very time consuming. You'll still have some content review here and there, but for the most part, you really wanna be through it by the middle of dedicated. So with that, um, you want time to not only go through you world, but go over your incorrects. You'll hear different things about people saying you should go through you world twice. You should go through you world three times. And I think that's a lot. Um, like I said, it's about 3,000 to 3,500 questions. So it's kind of a lot to put on yourself thinking that you'll get through you world three times. That's basically 9,000 questions and it's hardcore overkill. So I would definitely suggest prioritizing getting through UWorld once um, or at least getting through 90-ish percent of UWorld and then going through your incorrects. I think I really saw the bigger difference when I started going through my incorrects because you can basically select incorrect questions and then make a block out of that. And so you're going through 100% block of questions that you got wrong at one point that's huge it's like so rich because you're basically re-seeing these things with the thought in mind that you should have already kind of solidified those concepts ideally if you're studying your incorrects in the first place so if you continue to go through your incorrects you should be doing much better and if you aren't then you know that you didn't really take the time to learn it the first time which is huge it really tells you kind of whether or not your study tactics are working um and it can be pretty overwhelming it can be pretty humbling uh don't get caught up with the percentage that you're getting on you world just try to do your best and learn from your mistakes that's really all you can do 
So you want to be about halfway through dedicated with your content review and then you switch to questions or you do folk like more questions than content review. Um, and you're still doing questions sprinkled in with the beginning of your content review, but at the end of your dedicated, clearly you're going to be doing mainly content review. Um, and so dedicated can range anywhere between four weeks at some schools. Uh, some schools give you eight weeks. Uh, I think our school gives, I think six weeks, maybe eight weeks, because I know they're going through changes. But when I was taking it, we got six weeks and I had to extend my dedicated, um, which is something some schools will allow you to do. Um, but basically, if you don't feel prepared or you feel like, you know, you haven't gotten enough time, I would highly suggest just extending your dedicated, um, which for me also looks like skipping my first clerkship. This is kind of hard because it could potentially shift your third year schedule. It could shift the time at which you get to graduate. Um, but at the end of the day, I had to prioritize taking step one, making sure I was in a good position to take step one. And I don't regret uh, extending my dedicated because essentially it got me, you know, in a better position than what I would have been in originally. I will also go into a video on my personal experience with step one. And I think that that warrants a different video. It's a long story. Um, step one was exhausting for me. I am not an A plus student, uh, a straight A student. I, I do struggle with test anxiety. And that was definitely something that got in the way of my ability to actually do well on step one. And it was definitely something that I had to address. And I will go into detail with that in a, another episode. So stay tuned. Okay, so I think we got through the timeline pretty good. Dedicated does change based on the school that you're at. So that is something to consider when you're interviewing for schools, asking how much time students get for their dedicated step one study, as well as step two. But you know, more close to when you get into medical school. Step one. So, um, scoring. So, scoring of step one has changed recently. Um, my class was actually the last class to get a score, like a number score, and it is now pass-fail. So, a lot of students feel like, oh, because it's pass-fail, I'm automatically going to pass. Um, and that's not true. You're not promised to pass um, on step one. Now, one statistic that I did hear that I feel like was very representative was you perform on step one similar to how you perform on your class exams. Um, and this is dependent on how your class exams are formatted, but a lot of schools basically give you step one style questions anyway. So for me, this was very true. Um, I struggled with my class exams and I feel like I struggled with step one. Um, and so if you are that kind of student, you should definitely take the extra time necessary to prepare, even if it's pass fail, because you can still fail this exam. So that's really big. Um, a passing score is a 196 and it really just depends on how the cookie crumbles. Um, so I would highly suggest taking practice exams frequently throughout your dedicated study to make sure that you are at least passing your tests. This can be very humbling. If you are seeing yourself taking a practice exam, because um, at one point I was taking a practice test every week and I got three practice tests that were all the same score, uh, three weeks in a row. And this is kind of scary considering if I have six weeks of study and I've spent three weeks at the same mark, that's stressful. So you really wanna take time to really take those practice tests. If you see yourself getting the same score, really taking time to step back and reassess what you're doing and make some changes that can really help you see the difference. And I know that's a lot easier said than done, um, but I would not recommend just pumping through practice tests for the sake of pumping through them because it's not really going to give you fruitful results and that's what you want. So um, whew, the use of step one. Step one is used by residency programs essentially to see if you should get a spot in their program. So because step one is now pass fail, um, a lot of programs are going to shift their focus to uh, more higher on step two, which is also scored um, or which is scored. So although step one is pass fail, it's still a very important test. It's still required and uh, it's very, you know, 
exhausting. So it's definitely something you want to prepare for. Some don'ts that I would say, um, just to make a summary, don't wait till the last minute. Don't, you know, wait to study for it during dedicated. Don't avoid studying for step one um, before dedicated. And, and that kind of ties in the first one. But, um, you know, it's never a bad idea to start early. And I can't emphasize that enough. Even if it's using those resources, such as Boards and Beyond, Pathoma, and Amboss, some of those resources that you don't necessarily need to get right away um, really tightly, you know, organized in your dedicated, but sprinkled in throughout your curriculum could go a long way. So that, um, don't try to do what everybody else does. This is a very individualized process. Um, and so if you see a lot of people using UFAPs, but you feel like it's not really benefiting you, stop. 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 Literally. Um, if it's not working for you, you know, stop and change it and do what works for you. I'd say the first week of dedicated may be spent just figuring out what process does work for you, what resources work for you, you know, how you learn, how you're able to really retain the information and apply it. So give yourself grace in that. Um, and finally, allow yourself time to take breaks and have fun. My best friend got married during dedicated for me. Um, and I was very glad to still be a part of that process for her. I was her maid of honor and uh, I was still glad to be there. I would not have been able to really forgive myself had I skipped out on that. And it was a very stressful time for me. I was also, you know, not doing the best on my uh, practice test. And I was still kind of struggling with test anxiety and self doubt and, um, imposter syndrome, but I was still able to enjoy that experience, be there with my friend and have that memory. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. So allow yourself to have fun. Allow yourself to take breaks. Do not isolate yourself. Do not, um, deprive yourself of the joys that you really, uh, thrive from, such as seeing family. I was really mean to myself when I was studying for step one and I would say you know oh I don't deserve to go out with my friends uh after this practice test or oh I don't deserve to have the night off after studying all day long um and that really didn't help me it really only contributed to test fatigue and imposter syndrome and it you know, kept me in a rut. And so be kind to yourself, be patient with yourself. You're not going to know the answer to everything. You're not going to get a hundred percent on all of your U world blocks. Some blocks you may get a 20% and it's better that you take that experience, learn from it and don't take it personal. This is a hard test. Nobody gets a perfect score on this test. Well, it's not scored anymore. So there you have it. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. And you really have to understand that, you know, the test is just a test. It's nothing saying about, it's not anything that says the type of physician that you'll be, the quality of physician that you'll be, the duration of your career, how good you'll be to patients. None of that is on this test. It's literally testing your ability to apply the knowledge from first and second year medical school. So those are all of my notes and yeah, as mentioned, if you don't already follow me on Instagram, follow me at medical underscore mache um, and like, subscribe, share uh, this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, like this video, uh, leave a comment if you think that there's something else that I should have included or leave a comment of your step one journey. If you're planning on taking step one this year, uh, some of your fears, some of the things that you're concerned about. I'd love to have a conversation about, you know, ways that you can really incorporate stress management, um, within your studies. And yeah, so, and I can't emphasize enough when you do your practice test, you want to really mock the exam. So pack your, you know, step one bag, have a plan for what lunch you're going to have, know what breaks you're going to take and how long your breaks will be. And this is really important to get into the habit because it's a very important test to go with timing. So, um, yeah, stay tuned to the video about my step one experience where I also include details of how I went about doing my practice test, um, some tips and tricks that helped me with timing. Stay tuned and thank you as always for joining me. So, bye.